Greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. What a privilege, is, privilege it is to, to open this Sabbath with you here at Tui Ridge in our Vision 2020 Big Camp. This, con this, this conference camp meeting is for all of us. It's for every one of us, our brothers and sisters in the, in the church, our friends, those who, who come as acquaintances, as, as people that we have perhaps have invited. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to, to be privileged to participate in the messages that come to us from different people from all around the world. And particularly tonight, we're, we're blessed to uh, have been uh, introduced to our two keynote speakers, uh, Pastors Chris Oberg and Ty Gibson. And so it's really great for, for them to be with us here, particularly in the uh, adult auditorium where we can hear messages from God for this time, for this new year, to drive his goals and purposes as we anticipate this decade of the 20s ahead of us. Lord, as we gather in your presence at Big Camp this year, we come from a myriad of different experiences, but we come, Lord, with a, with a common goal, and that is to seek you. And so as we commence this evening, we thank you for the, for the opportunities, for the privilege. We thank you for all who have been able to come and all who are still on their way. We pray, Lord, that you would be very present with us, uh, particularly as we share this time this evening that you'll give us unction, that you'll give us your word for, for this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Vision 2020, it's a theme filled with metaphor and nuances of discernment and focus. Our theme verse, which comes from 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12, says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And in a modern translation, now all we can see of God is like a cloudy mirror, a cloudy picture in a mirror. Later we will see him face to face. We don't know everything, but then we will, just as God completely understands us. So how is your picture of God? What is your vision of Jesus like at this time? You know, vision leaks. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it, to, to keep a vision in focus, to keep it in front of us. And when it's not, we tend to forget. The vision ebbs. It fades as the routine, as the pressures of life continue in the everyday. And so we need communication. We need reminders. We need renewal. And what I say tonight is that our vision must be centered in the person of Jesus himself and his everlasting gospel. We say this because we see this in scripture that Jesus is the personification of God's love for all of us. This theme comes in the context of the chapter of, of love, the context of faith, hope, and love. And what it highlights is that God's love is supreme. God's love is eternal. So that when faith becomes sight and hope ends because now it's a complete reality, the greatest aspect, love, endures and continues forever because God is love. And his love has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. It is Jesus coming to us as God's action, an unconditional commitment to each one of us, God's promise that can never be broken. Jesus is the hope of the world. Jesus, the way, the truth with a capital T, and the very life itself. Can we have a 2020 vision of Jesus? John chapter 1, in the modern translation, in the beginning was the one who is called the Word. The Word was with God and was truly God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. And with this word, God created all things. 
Nothing was made without the word. Everything that was created received its life from him. And his life gave light to everyone. The light keeps shining in the dark, and darkness has never put it out. God sent a man named John who came to tell about the light and lead all people to have faith. John wasn't that light. He came only to tell about the light. The true light that shines on everyone was coming into the world. The word was in the world, but no one knew him. Though God had made the world with his word, he came into his own world, but his own nation did not welcome him. Yet some people accepted him and put their faith in him. So he gave them the right to be the children of God. They're not God's children by nature or because of human desires. God himself was the one who made them his children. The word became a human being and lived here with us. We saw his true glory, the glory of the only son of the father. From him, all the kindness and all the truth of God have come down to us. The apostolic witness from John who knew Jesus in the flesh, who experienced his presence and his touch. For someone here, maybe there's more than just one. It would be your first experience of a camp like this. You know, the seasons come and go. And as the old year has ended and the new year begins, so for us it's about looking for the new thing, as Josh shared with us, that God wants to do in our lives in this new year. And whoever you are, even if it's your first time to this camp, you've come to the right place at the right time to help you in this quest. And so in this camp time over the next few days is an opportunity to listen an opportunity to pray, an opportunity to open ourselves, to engage with God, to engage with God's word, God's communication from his messengers, to worship and renew, to refocus your perspective of God's love in Jesus Christ for you and I. And so my first prayer for, for us all is that all of us here at this camp is that we could come seeking God, seeking Jesus Christ, looking for him, wanting to know him more, to love him more, that we come with a desire to put him first in our lives. You will find me, God says. You will find me when you search for me. You will find me if you seek me with all your heart. And so in this camp time, I invite you, I challenge you, I implore you to seek Jesus every morning, every day, every opportunity in every message and interaction with the divine that you have here at camp. Can you do that with me, with one another? I invite you to. Let's give it a go. You know, we live with the now and the not yet, the now of knowing Jesus and the not yet of continuing to seek Jesus, of clarifying vision, of growing in our appreciation of him and of his mission in the great kingdom harvest. What is your picture of God? A picture of God from his majesty to his incarnate state of service, of humility, of love for people, of his love for, for you and I, the product of his creation. What a God we serve. And my second thing that I pray for is that in seeking God here at camp, we will gain a clearer picture and vision of who he is. Everything is complete in Jesus Christ. Yet our vision of him is cloudy because of our sinful state. No one can see God and live. Jesus and all of his glory is too dazzling for us. However, Jesus incarnate is the story of God and the most important lesson for us in our era, in our time, in our world. The Bible text reminds us that our view of God is limited and we are looking through a dim reflection, as it were, or a dim glass, but we're looking forward to the time when face to face we see him and then our vision will be complete 
then we will have knowledge with understanding. Hebrews chapter 1, long ago, God spoke to us, spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. By this, the writer is saying the absolute best and clearest revelation God could give has already been given to us in Jesus Christ. It's all complete. God has no more to say in that sense because he's said it all in his son, Jesus Christ. And so our vision of Jesus must always have him in front of us because he's our inspiration. He's our motivation. He's our purpose. And this journey we're on as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is about looking to him as the author, as the finisher of our faith, and also as the motivator of our Christian experience and practice, we're always to seek the vision of Christ. Because for us, because for you and I, it's the essential to life itself. Our picture of God, our vision of Christ, is our quest. The essence of discipleship. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Yes, but so much more. Follow me, and I will make you. I will make you in my image. Recreate you in the image of God. Regardless of who you are and who I am, our focus on Christ, our quest for him is what heals us, what, what restores each one of us. It's a lifelong healing and restoration, consummated and fulfilled only at the second coming of Jesus. We can never know all of Christ being the exact imprint of God, but we can know and learn enough of him for salvation. John said the true light came into the world. We have seen his glory, that of the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. And so we, the children of God, have this need to continually learn, to look, to, to grow, to understand, and we will ever grow in learning about God here on earth, later in heaven, throughout eternity, ever learning, never fully knowing as God knows. But in Christ Jesus, God has given all we need to know him is to love him, to love him is to follow him. And so my prayer also is that our vision of the risen Christ that we follow will lead us anew into the mission field, into the harvest, so that by his power of sending us, we will go, we will continue in this mission as we grow in Christ, so we also grow his kingdom with him. By beholding, we become changed, ever being renewed in his image and ever following him in his gospel harvest. I pray that in seeking Christ and growing in Christ, we will continue as workers in his harvest to show him to the people around us to prepare many for his soon return. You know, excuse me, you know, our focus as a conference over the last number of years has been moving more and more toward the mission of Jesus in the sense that focus on the kingdom is more important rather than focus on the church. When we say kingdom centric, we mean outwardly focused, that we're beginning to sort of see the vision that, that Jesus had for the world that he loves. So that the church, so that as a church, we're becoming involved uh, with it, not simply for our own benefit, not for our own personal nurture and fellowship, but rather that this nurture and fellowship happens in the context of the kingdom harvest. That we look out into our communities through the eyes of Jesus at how we can also ourselves be the presence of Jesus in our society in transformational ways. So we have said, making disciples, multiplying ministries, transforming communities. And as we journey into this new decade, beginning in 2020, we're trying to say, how can we 
How can we understand this better? How can we say it better? And I don't know whether we are saying it better, but let's, let me just share this with you. Servant disciples of Christ, active in the kingdom battle, working for the hurting, fulfilling the mission of Jesus. You know, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Missionaries for all of those that God wants to bring into his kingdom. And there's a way for all of us to fulfill this mission. I'm so thankful, you know, this evening for, uh, for all that Jesus has been doing in my life personally. You know, in the last few years, my journey has been through a number of twists and turns that I've never experienced before. Even in 2019, I was amazed at what I discovered about myself, lifetime mysteries uncovered. But at every step, even in the times when I felt lost, Jesus was there. And looking back, it's incredible to see just why and how he brought me through. But he brought us through it because he is God and he is able. He cares for each of us and he has a plan for you, for me. His plan includes us in his harvest mission. But it starts with our personal commitment. I know a number of you have been through this, ex this experience um, our youngest son, Benjamin, died five years ago. He was 28 years of age. As you may know, if you've experienced it or even imagine, it was the worst um, experience of our lives for Nolene and I and for his uh, older brother. It was a tragedy of epic proportions, you know, that had dangerous repercussions, but for God's power that brought us through with people's prayers, with the love of uh, family and support that we received. You know, when I pray for my son these days, I, I pray that the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness of God that Jesus brought through his incarnation and his sacrificial death on the cross for every one of us would somehow have its effect for my son. That the great victory won by Jesus would not be overcome by evil and that his gift of life would not be snatched away by the enemy of life. In the year that followed his death, I had dreams of my son. And there were three or four very memorable dreams, I guess. You know, all sorts of weird things happen when you're under a lot of stress and pressure. I know not many of you have experienced that. But these dreams, you know, they were brief flashes at times. July the 13th, 2015, I had one of these dreams. And in my dream, there was a, there was a knock on the door. And the door opened, and there he was, my son. And he walked in, and he came straight towards me. His family was there. His daughters were there. They're here tonight. But he came directly towards me. I looked in his face, and I knew he was different. What I saw made me so happy, filled my heart with joy. He was different, and I was different. The anger, the depression, alcohol, whatever it was, lots of stuff, all gone, all gone. Instead, there was peace, a slight smile, clear eyes, an earnestness, sincerity about him. He came in with purpose and direction, stood in front of me, and I, I heard the words, sorry, Dad. And he was still talking, but I didn't hear anything else. I couldn't hear what he was saying. I don't know what he was sorry for. I guess there would have been a lot of different reasons. But I was caught up in the moment of rapture. All I could see was his face, and the expression on his face told me everything. And the dream ended, and I was awake in tears. It was a flash, but it was a vision of hope, of a new beginning, of a better future. And I share that dream because it's a small taste 
of another greater vision that's presented to us in Scripture. And it comes from the messages to the churches in Revelation, to the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, likened so often to the church of our time. But as we read through those messages to the seven churches, we understand that every ailment that they had, that every blessing that they had is also ours. Because someone else is at the door knocking. And Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. He's talking to the church. He's talking to his people, to us. And I say us because he's addressing everyone, but it's an individual door, isn't it? It's the door of my life. It's the door of your heart. He's knocking and asking to come in. And when, you, when, and when the door is open and, and you look into that face, you see the very face of God himself. And he wants to be in your life to bring his forgiveness, to bring his healing, to let you know that he's on your side, to assure you that despite what is good in your life or even what is very bad in your life, he is able to bring his grace and peace to you to confirm that he wants a relationship and a friendship with you that will bless you now and forever. What a difference that makes when we have that vision of Jesus. Open the door. Always open the door. Invite him in because it's a life-changing experience. And when he's talking to the church, it's not just a one-off. It's every opportunity we have. Open the door for the church, for each of us down to the personal level, because you are the church, I am the church. Jesus wants his church to advance, his kingdom to grow, because his abundant and eternal life is for everyone. So tonight, again, I invite you here at Vision 2020 Big Camp to grab the opportunity, grab the opportunity to open the door to Jesus, to grow your picture of Christ to have a renewed vision of him in this new year of 2020. If you're like me, in many ways, you may be glad that 2019 is over. But for me, in other ways, I'm very grateful for the revelations and understandings that it has taught me. To seek Jesus and to get a renewed vision of him is, is vital. This is our greatest, our greatest task. You know, Jesus said, abide in me and I will abide in you. It's our greatest task is to remain connected to Jesus because what lies ahead for many of us will be difficult. Jesus on our side arouses opposition and hardship. And to obtain all of Jesus' blessings means we share in his sufferings. But it's okay because he's promised. He's promised us, hasn't he? And, and the principle, even though it's specific, the principle is broad and it's general and it applies to us. He says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. And he that has the Son has life. Can you say amen to Jesus in 2020? Amen.